Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I started the analysis on Jupyter Notebook and I almost finished everything, mm -hmm. except I have to modularize that in the uh, stream lead sense. Mm -hmm. And I'm just frustrated that I'm, I might not make it in time. I will just submit what I will have. So do you have any suggestion on that? Okay, uh, if you have done the pre-processing in EDA part in your notebook, it's just easy to compile it and to make it a script like that, which looks like the streamlit code. And I don't think it will take you more than two or three hours. Mm, yeah, uh, I will try. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, nice. Yes. Any other issue? If not, let me go through my presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK. Uh, today, we will focus on modeling and dockerization part and the basic idea behind the modeling is how we can build a machine learning model and how can we deploy it um, what are the things which we need to consider while uh, modeling and deployment so from the deployment part we will see the tokenization how we container how can we containerize the existing machine learning model plus our endpoints and in order to be usable with using throughout different machines or maybe sometimes you're uh, running your code on your local machine and there are some version mismatch or operating mismatch operating system mismatch on your server so in order to overcome that issue we need to localize uh, the existing application basically today we will see how to do that and um, the last topic is rather apart from this building the model plus dockerization we will see the packaging uh, which is similar to dockerization but uh, with uh, a different Can you hear and see my screen? Yes. So the packaging is simply for software distribution, which means that we, if we want to distribute our software and usable in anywhere else, any, anyone can uh, pip install it. So we will go for that option but it has its own limitation like apart from using this dockerization packaging is all also laser isolated so you need it's all, almost environment dependent so dockerization will give you that isolation because it's running on separate docker engine so that means you get that flexibility to distribute your uh, existing application so uh from last time, I think you have got basic experience on how to build a model. And just before you are doing anything, you have to just clean and load the data, interact with the data, know your data, what are the necessary features uh, to develop machine learning models. And based on that, you will select the appropriate model. Uh, which will align with your existing problem. Let's say if you are trying to predict uh, something, a binary classification, you must use a machine learning model that are suitable for binary classification. And also, if you have some, if you want something which is improved in multiple um, multiple features so, or multiple classification levels. So you can use this desk frame of the support vector machine or any of the models which from the supervised learning or 
uh, from the unsupervised learning, which which one which is the appropriate for your specific problem. So based on that, you will select your model, then you will start to build. And this model building process will have iterative process because uh, in first instance you will not go the uh, you will not get the accuracy you want so you have to optimize you have to tune into your expected output or into your expected accuracy level or precision level or it's, uh, you have certain measurement like sensitivity or specificity so based on that sensitivity you will arrive uh, to a certain point, and if that's the minimum acceptable threshold for your model to perform, so you will use that model and save it for the later usage, and you will save those features for later usage also. And once you have the feature, the model, then... Is that a question? If you have a question, I'm not seeing your questions, that's why you can uh and you then talk so basically these are the four main steps which we follow while building the machine learning models and when we come to the dockerization uh why we need this dockerization because we need to reproduce our script into multiple uh, environments which means if someone is using Ubuntu or Windows or AWS, so the code should have to work as expected. So in order to mitigate this one, we can use the Docker, and which will act as a container for your scripts. And that container will know everything, the dependencies, the libraries you have, everything. It will encapsulate that one. And once you build your Docker, you have a Docker image which will be stays in your local machine or else in Docker Hub. In Docker Hub. Then one, when you go to Docker Hub, you have to create an account and post it. You post your model there. Then you will reuse the image, Docker image, as much as you want. So <clears throat> this will give us. Uh, an isolation or the capability of isolation because the container cannot be affected with your system and the current any of the current setup in your local machine or in your server. That means your script is containerized and it's isolated. So this is a big thumbs up. While you are working with multiple development environments. So in order to do the machine learning, you need to know what's Docker first and how can it works and what the Docker uh, container contains, which, as I said earlier, the container contains the your script plus the dependencies plus the library, and it's a package bundle of application code, and that requires everything. And the Docker image is the executable format, like the exe or the version of your code so that will be hosted on docker image then and this docker image can be hosted into docker hub and you can extend that one by uh, knowing the docker commands there and it becomes a container when it's uh, the container is not running time uh, so steps for dockerization, you need to set up your Docker on your local machine. Then you have to create your requirements to txt as every of the code needs this one. And also you, you may need based on the need, you may need to git ignore plus docker ignore files. And then you will add the docker file, the actual docker file, what to do, when to start, how to start. Then the, here are some Docker command guidelines, so you can check those things from here. And basically, these are the example uh, Docker bash tags, uh, which we have uh, in order to build Docker 
or in order to publish Docker or in order to run. So you can integrate this Docker with uh, CI, CD, or GitHub Action. And the last one is from my topic is the packaging one. And mainly we will use this one for uh, software distribution or the one which you install, like pip install, pandas pip install, numpy. Uh, so this kind of uh, how to do this kind of configuration for your uh, script. So uh, if I go directly to the implementation, maybe if you have any question, let me. If not, um, this is the example packet. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, this is the example project um, folder which I am uh, prepared for this uh, class. So we will mainly, our main focus on this um, use case is to predict the diabetic patient, pre-admitted diabetic patient, and whether if they are pre-admitted or not. So we want to predict that one. There's no certain diabetic data. So I have this kind of diabetic data, which have, as you can see, it's a lot. So I need to go through the EDA part. So I have prepared a, a notebook for that one. Basically, in, pro, in pre processing part, I have done this handling the null value in the standardization, but maybe it's, this is depends this depends on your data requirement and your expected outcome. And once uh, I'm doing this is for, for demo purpose, I didn't do that much, but you have to explore your data deeply by going through the univariant analysis, by variant analysis, and any of the things which your data can entail you or which gives you an insight. So you have to get that from your data. And once you have done with that, you will identify the, those features which are more important to, to your, what you call it, uh, modeling. So what I have done is I just loaded the data. I have sent the um, I have seen the columns and the data which is built. And based on this, I have to check if there is any missing value that uh, this data may contain. So point three five uh, missing value. Uh, which means uh, that some kind of accepted missing values. So if there are columns which have 30% uh, missing value, I should have to drop them. So based on my analysis, I have to drop this uh, five columns. So I have done that. Once I, I have done that, I have to fill uh, the missing value. So in order to do that, I have prepared a script there. Uh, which can do that for me. Maybe this is, it's not that much modularized, but you can make it class and reusable enough. Well, you can, if you prepare this one in week one, then it will be much more easier for you to reuse them in the later weeks also. So this is how I count the missing values. And this is how I can fill uh, the forward fill method using the forward fill method and the uh, backward fill method for uh, entity values or missing values. Then, based on that one, so if it's that one, I will go to the next one because my data yeah, doesn't have any entity value. Okay. 
So my question is in regards to the missing values. What does a backward and forward feeling mean? When do we use each? It depends on your context, but you can use either of them to feel like backward feeling means uh, how do you want to feel the data? Let's say it contains uh, a missing value after it. Uh, so the backward field will feel the um, backward value to artist your MPT data. That means the immediate next one. And the forward field will be will feel will use the missing to fill the missing value from the forward value, and which goes at either to backward or forward. Okay. I think Thank it's. You. it's uh, yeah, I wanted to know the difference between the different uh, I feel now, so I can mm -hmm. see that the methods are different. Which one? Uh, can you show your screen? Yeah, I'm sharing still. On the code or? Yeah, I'm in the notebook. Okay. Can you see this? Which, which portion do you want? Yeah, there. Okay. So in the... Can you scroll a bit on? I mean, when you you replace the the missing value, you fill them. You use the two methods. I can see. Yes, that, yes, yes, yes. Here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just want to know the meaning of F filler and B fill. So as I have explained, F fill will. Fill the next value from the exact the next column, and B fill will fill uh, the previous value from the previous column, but in the same box. This is a built-in uh, function, data frame, panda function. Mm. It's not clear yet. Okay. I know. Uh, it's not clear. No, it's not really clear. So we have a values in data frame, yes. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have column A. If column A and its value is. one comma like this then yes. I want to I want to apply B field to here so what will be my output is to this column and I should have to replace the any values with three then in that case if I use the Forward field method, I will replace the num value with three. If I use um, the backward method, I will replace this one by one. Okay. okay thank you. But you can read more on how you can use this backward field and forward field on you from the pandas. Yeah, okay, good. By the way, what in which real case we can use that? Because I know sometimes uh, uh, to replace the non value, we can yeah, it use depends the mode on, or the mean. 
it depends on your data need uh, or your model need because your modeling doesn't allows you to have null values so but based on the data set you have if you can remove those rows which have null value that would be one case but in some other case if you have limited data you have to uh, fill them based on this kind of filling mechanism or you have to either fill them if they are all uh, row like uh, numeric data with zero or if they are categorical data with uh, any of the okay categorical values which you need to uh, replace so if not let me go to the rest of the descriptions so basically as you can see these are the some of the columns which have categorical data and some of them have the uh, non-categorical data so i have to replace all the things um, into numeric because machine learning models can only understand numeric values uh, as you can see i can see that um, one or two of my columns have uh, mpt value uh, i need to deal with that i have removed them and based on that the numeric value i have converted it into number values and when you see this it doesn't have anything so now i'm good to go for next step i've done the basic pre-processing and in order to go for modeling i need to encode everything that's categorical uh, so i have used the label encoder to encode the data and you can see that i can transform everything into this one this is one of the transformation phase so now if i scroll here you can you couldn't see anything which is not a numeric value uh, that means i have correctly encoded everything here in the suspect so my data which i will use as a label is the one which is called as a readmitted one so this is my data language and the rest of the x uh, or the features list are this so in the next part i have to go to a feature selection step and this feature selection step we have multiple feature selection methods and from those i have used uh, the select k based feature method and i passed certain functions and parameters there but you can have a chi square test or any of the test and the selection mechanisms or you can select the features by yourself or you can draw a simple random forest classifier and draw the feature importance based on what i have uh, now from the select based select based method i have uh, plotted the uh, feature importance and each feature have which what kind of importance uh, to, uh, what type of contribution to the my y level or from the uh, for the we admitted one and uh, you can see that i have plotted the feature importance also then based on this i should have to select uh, features that are necessary for this specific classification task so my initial thing is to use uh, to define whether this is a classification task or not classification task or unsupervised or supervised tasks because i have the y column uh, which is called as a readmitted or column so i have a predefined level so i have to go to the supervised machine learning uh, modeling and for that 
for that one, I have this features or 42 columns. So from those 42 columns, I need to minimize and I have to take those which are specific to uh, specifically contribute to the, the admitted or not. So based on this feature selection method, I have selected uh, those ones which are most necessary. Uh, so you can see that these are the necessary fields which I need or the most contributing factors for uh, patients in diabetics to be readmitted. Uh, so uh, once I have this one, I have to save this into separate thing. And these are my feature list. And also these are the Y labels which I have or my uh, labels uh, for the further modeling. Uh, now I have to save this one into a separate uh, data. Then you can see the features like this because I have encoded them and the labels like this. And once I have done this, I have to go for the modeling one. Oh, so when we come to the modeling one, now we have to do certain things uh, because uh, we are using or uh, building this machine learning model. So we need to split uh, the number of training sets and the number of test sets in our test sets. So if you want, uh, you can all of them to split train test splits. Based on you can split them 80 20, which means 80% for training from your data and 20% for testing or 19, which is 90% for training and 10% for testing, or else 60, 40. Uh, this can be much more uh, good when you have more data and 90, 10 uh, is much better when you have small data uh, because you need more data for training purpose and for testing purpose if it's a test size is also small, uh, it can be fine. And also the other thing which we have is the Minimax scalar. So in order to uh, prevent this overfitting or underfitting problem in your model, so you need to scale them or standardize the input based on this Minimax scalar or there are several reversing or scalar techniques which you can refer. Then job lead is the the one which I used to set the trained model and have dump and load function. It's similar to pickle, but have used this one. Then, as I told you earlier, my problem is classification problem, whether it's a binary classification, which means it have only two labels, readmitted or not, either zero or one, which means it becomes suitable for this one. So I have random forest uh, classifier and uh, in terms of model selection uh, I have used the cross validation technique in order to uh, chunk my data into multiple uh, validation steps and to get the exact uh, the average of the accurate uh, the, uh, their accuracy based on the shuffling the training set and these are the metrics which we can use for measuring accuracy and you have the pure accuracy precision score recall score f1 score confusion matrix you can use any of them and also other model like SVM linear SVC model or from the support vector machine model and there are so many classifiers out there then according to your uh, data need, you can uh, shift here and there and switch one from one to another. As an example, I will show you with random forest classifier. So the thing is that from the previous uh, selected features which I have, I have uh, to load that one and from the while from my labels, I have to load those things. And based on that, this is the result which I have in the, 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 the data. Then 
this is also the admitted or not admitted uh, we admitted one so have uh, three labels then i will go to the training test split i have used the 80 20 uh, train test split method which will uh, reserve 80 percent for training and 20 percent for testing so based on that i have to scale it and the scaled one will be loaded to pickle and for future use if i want to use this one in the future so i could change this one from two to three from three to four based on my data uh, you can use any of them and once uh, you have the pickle data or the transform data you can use that one in later while you train because uh, whenever you train machine learning model you need only the numeric value then the last step is calling the actual classifier and uh, giving this the training and the testing set and use you can see that i have used five uh old gaming uh cross validation and i got the average score of uh 0 0.45 uh 0 0.54 which is not that much good but as a starting point it was good for me and um, these are how you can predict you can model dot fit and model dot predict are the um what you call it commands to call your model uh, instance so these are the things which you will have and, uh, you will get the confusion matrix like this and based on this i have the precision recall f1 score for each level for zero for one for two so based on that that you can see the coverage you can see the average accuracy and you can see the weighted average accuracy from here and this is the much more better way of presenting the your classification report and um, as an improvement which i can suggest for this one is like model logging model registration and data versioning will be the other tasks which i need i didn't implement here but uh, as we for example for the random forest classifier we can just do a simple ml flow registration and you can see that with this ml flow and with this data i have the run the ml run results and the first one tells me the its artifacts the model which i use the values everything the machine learning model and it have all the things which I need to register. When further I come back, I will, I can restart from this one and the training confusion matrix can be presented like this. And the inputs which I get to this one, it have this kind of data and every information which you need to see from your first run and this is the training log for the F1 score. This is the training log for its loss. This is the training uh, precision log, the recall score, the AUC curve. Everything you will get it here and registered. And the parameter which I have used, the class weight. And you can refer this one uh, when you go through it. Then once I have this, I can use this one to restart my training again. Uh, or I can do another analysis. Or I can like I can shift the training from uh, the training and test speed from uh, 80 20 to 60 40 or 90 10. So based on that, I will get the artifact and each of my run will be registered here and it, none of my data will be uh, lost during this uh, repeated training, then I, I would select the best model and I can compare each uh, metrics 
uh, which I have used, then it's better for me to write uh, if I have this kind of um, extracted uh, information about each term, because when you are developing or when you are experimenting the any model, you will not have the chance to uh, write everything as instant because as a developer, maybe you can change this one as two five, then you have to go, then you see the some results, then that result will may may or may not be may not satisfy you. So you can change this from five to ten uh, or to eight. Then when you go you, when you try multiple times, you will forget the features you have used or the hyperparameters you used for tuning purpose. So in order to avoid that, you can use the simple ML flow or the weight and the bias model to register for you. And that will save you much time. And also you can present your complete report when, at the end of the day. Then the next part is how can uh, so we have developed certain model, the result is accepted. So how can we reuse this model or how can we make it reusable into our application? So in this case, in this specific project, you have a streamlit application. So you need to depict this model. and also to provide the inference to, your, to user input from the front end. Uh, so I prefer this scenario that the, the more so fast API. So this is my API folder structure. And as a model things and I have I can do here the selected features and give that as an input with a dictionary format. Then I have one single route. Then based on that, I have this one. You can see that I have two endpoints and I have to the first one is the start one, the second one is the predict one. So based on the data which I give uh, here. I can predict the instance from the previously the model that I saved is stored in here. So based on that, I can infer and send a request from the request model. Mm. So this is the example one. You can see uh, the predictor value is zero because I didn't pass this one to uh, the main router but you can change the, the the incoming dictionary into this data format uh, or in your specific data format then based on that format you will pass that to your model then it gives you the prediction and also you can pass this prediction into whether it's there what does zero means zero is admitted or not admitted or which one or unknown, so you can pass that one also. But just this is a simple uh, example to show you how it works with the API endpoint. And in order to run the a API, um, I have used this fast API plus ubicorn, and ubicorn this um, main dot app dot reload is the last function, and my you can see my router, uh, my app is here. So I have to call this all the time when I, when I want to start the fast API endpoint. And this is the thing from the API perspective. Now I can call this one from my stream read app. Then I can pass that to the visualization step. And that's it from the API perspective. And from the dockerization perspective, I have to come back and go through every of the things because this is my initial Docker file. And this is built on the Python 3.5. So I have to uh, define that one. As you can see, Docker doesn't have any extension. It will start with the capital and the Docker file. 
and uh, it's there it's usually we use this one a convention so in order to write a docker file you have to use this format without extension then the current working directory in the docker is user source app so i have to specify it like this and i will copy all the things which i have in here to this app folder then if i have a requirement.txt i have to install that requirement.txt file and also i have to exp i want to expose this one with port 80 or you can do whatever port you want so you have to specify that port then environment name if you if you are in dev environment you can have dev or if you are in production you can have production environment then you will write that specific thing here then what's the command line uh, uh, well, when do you want to launch the application or what's the command to run your application? Maybe this is this can be an FM start, but now I am providing the fast API endpoint, so I have to use the UV core. Then my app, the, the links to my app or to my main uh, file, so API.main is my file so i have to pull that up and i have to expose it in port 00, zero. then the port one uh, this is this one is for localhost and this one is the port number uh, this is the example for you to have and uh, what you can do is now you can build this docker like uh, this is the previous one which I used to experiment and I have exposed this one. Um, so in order to build the Docker file, so I have to use docker build minus tag, then my project name, and it will start running and building the copying everything from here to the docker instance then everything which i have specified here will be executed step by step uh, before that let me show you one thing from the docker uh, basically you have to have this uh, docker container in local machine maybe if it's not applicable you can have this uh, docker image because the test product is the one which I have earlier. So you have the image list here, the container list here, and everything uh, which you have uh, for your docker container will be recorded here, or else you can have uh, the actual docker implementation from here and from docker hub. So you have to log into here and you will post your uh, Docker, your script to here and your image. You can later uh, build from that image which is posted on the, the Docker Hub. So if I want to run the Docker, Docker run, then the port number, then the project which I have. Then basically I have to wait until it starts. Uh, then I have, I can make this request to this one. Uh, as if we know that post it needs uh, these variables when I have to pass this thing this may or may not work but we can say something This is it. Uh, basically, what 
you can do with the Docker one and also with the actual local implementation. And from the setup dot perspective, uh, from the packaging ones, you have to have this kind of setup dot py in your uh, project folder. Then you have to specify that the project name, the version, the author, email, and your GitHub repository to that specific email with me. Markdown, if you have any of this thing, you can do that. And these are the like a kind of accepted format for packaging purpose and uh, what are the Python requirements, uh, you, if you have any license or, or uh, any of this license, so you could put that one also, and also uh, the requirements the txt should have to be specified like this, and based on that, if this was a package which I want to redistribute, I have to do this and pipe install and it will give me the exe file and um, not exe file the distribution file and that distribution file will be loaded to uh, um, to this. So every Python file will be uploaded here. So if you can, you complete that setting up your setup.py, you, you will run that one. And that will give you the list folder. And that will lead you to upload this one to the five projects. And this is for one specific project, and you will make your uh, package to be installable into pipe installable format. Um, I think this is it. Maybe if you have any question, let me have it or any, anything on this. I will share the all things which I have here with you, with GitHub, and I will add that GitHub to the slide. Okay. Okay. So what I will do is I try to so that it can be the action and excuse. The super I will share that one. And I will add this the link to the slide here. Still that touch and please have a question. Okay. Yeah, the, the question is, is not regarding the tutorial, but uh, it is something that, that is blocking me right now. Um, and if you allow me, I can share my screen quickly. Uh, yes, you can maybe, can we do it after the, the call? It won't be long, I will, it won't be long. Mm -hmm. Let's wrap the class, then you will go. Please. Let's wrap the class, or you can go. If anyone wants to leave, they can leave. OK, can you see my screen? Yes. OK, good. So, um, I have an, an issue with uh, my my repo. I just uh, uh, as you can see here, those files have uh, have just have just deleted. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't I don't know why, but uh, it is uh, after uh, after trying to complete my 
Yes. Your voice is not clear, but it's breaking. Please? It's breaking, your voice is not clear. Uh huh. So I was saying that uh, I was trying to, to commit some of my tasks on my repo, and suddenly I realized that there are some of my files that are deleted. So I don't understand why. So I don't know if somebody have uh, faced that challenge before and can help me to know the reason why so that I can avoid that uh, for the future. Hello? Do you understand, Do you understand me? Yes, can you show me your GitHub repository? Uh, from the browser. Okay, from the browser. Um, How many branches did you create? Uh, I created two branches. We put two branches. Um, let me see, let us see the branch there. Um, You can cut this request or you can cancel it. Mm. Maybe you have a switch to your branch. One thing which I could suspect. Can you go back to the terminal? To go to what? Terminal. Term okay. Yeah. Git branch. Those are the branches I created. So you are in the main. Actually, yes. Actually, I am on the main. Uh, I, I can't. But your base support says you are in master. Please? Can you open your base code? Base code, base code. Yeah. This shows me master. It's a master branch. Yeah. Can you see this one? Are you showing something? Uh, here in your uh, left bottom, it shows it's a master branch. From timeline outline, then at the bottom. Uh, no, no, not there. Here what? on the left side. Left corner, left bottom corner. Can you see that? The timeline outline. Yes, here. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. At the bus. It says it's master branch. Can you click it, that one? So just to switch to you, any of the branches which you are currently working, if you switch to that one, you will get the actual file.
Oh, does it mean? What's your git remote, maybe? Mm. Shall I cancel? Yes, cancel it. And switch to any of the branches. Or task one, task two. No, actually, shift just on the main. Yeah, can you see your documents there? Mm. Oh, no. Unwrap the scripts above the readme. Yeah. No. So it and doesn't this. have anything. If you check this one in your GitHub also, it doesn't have anything. Maybe can you switch to task one? Task one branch. In principle, you don't have to push this slash PyCache files to GitHub, or so you can add them to git.git .git ignore file. Okay. So that may lose you, you know, protect you from loading unnecessary package to GitHub, but this is mainly a GitHub branch issue. So if you, if you find you can find the your code from the GitHub, so you can delete this one and clone it again. What I said, I would suggest. So but otherwise, I, I should I should start at the beginning again. No, no, no. Why you start uh, to the beginning? You can because um, I try to to see if I can find. If you couldn't find, then you could rename this one to certain file, the notebook, which I can see that. But if you get that one from your GitHub, if you have pushed that, you should have to get from the GitHub in principle. Really? But as you can see. <clears throat> can you open the browser? Uh, which one? Browser. Uh, Your Chrome. I want to go to GitHub. Google Chrome. Okay. okay. It's not opening, why? I should have to open. Just wait it. Maybe connection. Let me try if it's uh, the simple search is working. Yeah, the simple search is working, so yeah. Yes, is you can try with new tab. New tab. Okay. I guess it's opening now. The previous one also.
By the way, for the time being, uh, I would like to ask you another question. In why you are present, why you are presenting, I didn't uh -huh. see um, a folder like a script and the lib that that are created after you create a virtual environment. So, uh, I have used Conda environment. Please? I have used Conda environment, not virtual environment. Oh, okay. So you don't need uh, every time to create a virtual environment no, no, I, for each I have created a virtual environment with Conda. Okay. Okay. It's not coming, right? It's coming. Hey, hey, Rudolph. Yeah. Uh, are you sure you didn't just delete the files from your uh, lo local uh, pro project uh, folder? If, uh, can you say your question again, please? Are you sure you didn't just delete the files from your local project uh, folder? Yeah, I deleted one one file in my project. Uh, were you trying to were you trying to copy and paste, cut and paste? Maybe you deleted that. Uh, maybe you deleted the files from. Uh, your local uh, projects folder. Yeah, b uh, b uh, but what I deleted, I deleted before committing and pushing on my branch, uh, on my first branch, which is a uh, task one. If you are deleted before pushing, so how do you want to get to restore it back? I know. No, yes, it's not what I push. Those are the one I want to to see, but I'm not seeing. Um, maybe I would say maybe this just one. Just one these files are not the file that I deleted because those are the files in which I was. Working. Maybe you deleted them uh, by accident. So why don't you go to the folder that they were in, uh, to your project folder? The cycle bin, maybe. The cycle bin is good. Okay. No, you could just go to uh, first. You could just go to um, the, the project folder uh, if you can. The week one folder. Yes, the week yeah, one. Let, let me explain. You see, and then try, try and control Z. Uh, try and like. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think con Control Z can work here. Okay, maybe you check the recycle bin because maybe you deleted them permanently. I think it's uh, your desktop, maybe. Uh, so, where were your uh, notebook uh, files uh, located? Are, uh, were they in the week one uh, folder or? Maybe in the lib folder or I don't know. No, I, yes, I, I put my, my work in week one folder. So no, I, no, I, go I, to before. desktop, then recycle bin. You said? Desktop, then recycle bin. From the quick access desktop. I'm not hearing you. Can you open up your desktop? Just the desktop folder there from downloads, document, pictures from the right, left side. In quick access menu, desktop. Yeah, Bob. Okay. We don't have recycle bin here. Um, 
So where do you find your recycles? Just uh, just to just to Windows uh, key and then D at the same time. Windows uh, press the Windows key and and D at the same time to so that we can see your desktop. Yeah, this is the desktop. My God. <laughs> okay, so you've changed the default uh, icons that, that are yeah. Maybe you so can right click and show the icons to us. Right click. Uh, can you do right click on the desktop? Okay, maybe uh, I can I can restart from the beginning. There's no problem. So no problem. Just let's change another call. Why don't you Why don't you just do uh, or to find the recycle bin? You can do Windows and then S at the same time. Windows and what? S. 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 Yes. S. S. Yes, yes, and then like just type start. something. I'm a bit lost. Uh, just try to search recycle bin as in R E C Y. Yeah, and then yeah. like open the bin up. Nothing is here. No, nothing is here. So. Maybe, Maybe you, you could just pu pull the whole uh, project from your GitHub that you pushed uh, until this point. I don't know, Mahalit. I, I think you should. You can help him with that. Yeah, I have. I have said that, but we cannot see what's there on his GitHub, so that's why. Yeah. Can you go to the VS Code? Yeah. Yes. So maybe dbcon dot py. Where was it? Where was it located? Uh, this one was. Uh, yeah, I put that one. Uh, in uh, code okay in this folder code code Th then go yeah. back to the uh, code folder uh, right now It is empty. Everything is empty. Okay. I think uh, how I don't know how to delete it. Yeah, uh, maybe you can, maybe you can control it from here. Yeah, I did it. It doesn't work. Doesn't work. Yeah, I did the same thing yesterday, but I was able to get it back uh, by just uh, doing control Z. Hmm. It's very strange. By the way, the only option I'm seeing actually is to it to start. Yeah. So yeah. I try to manage. I think you so can hope you will get through it. Uh, um, uh, okay, so on your uh, on your I mean on your VS code. 
to go on VS Code again? Yeah, go on VS Code, yes. Okay. So go to the, on the left side, there are a lot of uh, icons, right? You can see the version control icon. That has a like clock uh, icon like on it. Uh, the version. No, yeah, that one. That one. Yes, yes, yes. So in the changes, look look for something that's deleted, right? Um, sorry to interrupt, but. Um, the reason why I don't have data in the folder is because main branch is not merged. The task one is not merged to the main branch. And I don't think he can be um, PR request for his task one. And uh, he tried to pull it from the main branch, but the main branch is already empty. But he, I think he has the copy inside the, I don't know what branch he used, but task one. I'm not so I think it's good to, uh, if you go back to his uh, GitHub and view, this one has the code. Uh, yes, I think that's a good idea. Would you mind if you go back to your GitHub and let's see if, if you create uh, this one? The, the GitHub is not working though. <laughs> It, 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 it should work. It's just that he has so many browser tabs open. I know. Probably. Also, you're uh, you're running out of memory. Like uh, yeah, the, the all snap uh, alert is because you're running out of memory, Rudolph. Okay. Now, now, let me see. Ah, yes. But it's not the main issue. Not, so not the storage. Concern. I meant memory as in like uh, your RAM. Uh, yeah. And no, no my RAM. Would you mind closing? Yeah, it's okay. Just, just, uh, just close, yeah, just some, just, of yes, close some of the tabs you have here. Yes, close some of the tabs. Try to close some of the tabs, then let's go and see your GitHub um, branch. Oh, uh, what, what, what shall I close? You Some need the YouTube, your collab. Ah, okay. Uh... Now it's opening, I think. Uh, let's go to your GitHub repo for this specific project. I think it's good if you close uh, some of the application downstairs, like something like Discord is really consume RAM and uh, might be even the get, uh, get back just to save on me. Yes, sometimes I like to blindly close the whole Chrome window and try to get some of the tabs back by myself. Uh, one one is popping up. Go to the GitHub. Um, the GitHub. No, the GitHub, the GitHub is not still working. Do not really, sorry. The GitHub is not still working. I think can you tell us if there is someone here? Can you stop the recording? It's not the recording, it's just the internet bandwidth and uh, no, 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 run. Uh, not for him. Oh, okay. Anyone from Tenakada?
Is there a major thing if you close this whole thing beside the Google Meet? Um, and Please? Just open a new, run new tab. My, don't close the Google Meet and tabs. Just close everything else. Would that, would that affect you in any way? Mm, I shall close again. Why do you have uh, Discord applications up there and you use the web browser and just just that this uh, Discord application because you might not know Discord really takes a lot of time to get by with. Hassan, 